For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Looking at verse 53 through 57. I'm just trying to do a little cleanup on um, this before I move on. We've talked about this a great deal. Um, Pharaoh's dream, uh, seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, and Israel now in the land of Egypt. They've left the promised land of Canaan and have gone to the Egypt. And uh, they won't return for 430 years. That's a pretty long time to stay someplace, ain't it? Wouldn't want those relatives to show up at my house. 430 years. Well, in verse uh, 53 dealing with uh, the seven years of plenty which had been in the land of Egypt came to an end. And the seven years of famine began to come, just as Joseph had said. Then there was a famine in all the lands. Notice that's plural. That's the reason your title says Middle East. But in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. Now, there's, Egypt has become the breadbasket of the Middle East. But did they go through the famine? No. Yeah, they went through the famine. Yeah, they went through the same severe famine that everybody else did. Yet their nation was the breadbasket to everybody else. And this was a starvation famine too. This wasn't just a... This, this seven-year famine put people in the Middle East without exception into starvation. And the only place you could get bread was was Egypt. That's it. But the famine put them in starvation, see. And that famine hit Egypt just as hard as it hit everybody else. All right. The seven years of famine began to come just as Joseph had said. There was famine in all the lands. Verse 55, so when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried out to Pharaoh for bread. You know the difference in that in the Exodus? You know who the people in the Exodus cried out to? <laughs> Later they did. But in the original beginning, they cried out to the Lord, and he heard their prayer. But when you don't have, when you don't have a God system... Say, when you don't have a, the divine system working for you, then this is who you call on, this is who you look to, and that's your, that's your civil government. And uh, so much for that. So, so when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried out to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. And whatever he says to you, you shall do. When the famine was spread over the face of the earth, then Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, and the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. And all the people of the earth came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe uh, in all the earth. And we don't know how far that spread because our story was only concerned with the Middle East. But you can see where Egypt, Egypt became the breadbasket of the Middle East. Egypt became the breadbasket of the Middle East. So our lesson today after Word of Prayer is going to deal with that subject matter. You know, you, we probably don't pay that much attention to it, but America has been that for years and years and years. I mean, when, uh, when uh, a disaster hits a nation, another nation, even if there are enemies, we go in and help them if they... If, if they so desire. I mean, we, we're the most generous people, and it's because of the influence of, uh, of the true God's 
nature upon the hearts of the people. I mean, the only reason Egypt became the breadbasket of the Middle East is because of one man. One man. And, and that was Joseph. It wasn't Pharaoh. Pharaoh had the good sense to put this young man in charge of everything. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll talk about this and uh, how one man and one nation could do uh, powerful things for other people throughout the world. I give you a moment of silence. I believe a priest and dwelt with the Holy Spirit as a believer. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day, the moment you believe that, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your body because you live in the church age under the new, new covenant. This didn't happen in other places, other times of the Bible. This is New, new Testament. And the Holy Spirit's there to teach you the truth of the Word of God. It, it's not about your education. It's not about your human IQ. It's about your spiritual interest in the Word of God. And then responding positive. You can't study it in, in the flesh. You have to study it in the spirit. Confession of your sin separates you from the dynamics of the Holy Spirit working in your life. We call that carnality. You don't need to be saved again, but you do need to be spiritual. And the way you do that is through the confession of your personal sins. It could be a mental attitude sin, anger, hate, malice, something like that. It could be a sin of the tongue. It could be an overt sin. The Bible tells you what sins are and what they're not. And when you confess it according to 1 John 1, I, when you name it or cite it or state it to God, he forgives you of that sin and cleanses you from it and allows the Holy Spirit to be restored to your life so that you can do spiritual things and learn the Word of God as a spiritual person. So I'm going to give you a moment to do that. So, Father, we're thankful today for your love and mercy and grace extended to us through Jesus Christ of the cross. Through his burial and resurrection, we are justified to be able to be spiritual people all the time, every moment of the day, because it's volitional. It's volitional to walk in the power of the Spirit. It's volitional to confess our sin. It's volitional. We pray tonight that people here have exercised that so that they can learn something from the Word of God tonight that would improve their life, their quality of life in regard to what God expects from them and not what others do. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In our story, passage, Egypt has become the breadbasket, literally, for the Middle East. We are told that in verse 54. Seven years of famine began to come just as Joseph had said. There was famine in all the lands, but in all the lands of Egypt there was bread. And that's because Joseph was a key pin in it. In verse 57, it says, The people of the earth came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe in all the earth. People of the earth came to Egypt to buy grain. That's why they became the breadbasket. Of the Middle East. Now what I want to do with you tonight. Is I, I, I want to answer six questions. To try to get a perspective. Of the historical impact. That one man. Joseph. A believer. A guy no different you and I. Except he went through some pretty severe testing maybe. Not that we don't go through some testing. And we probably think it's severe. Until we look at somebody else's life. And say wow mine is not as bad. But we all go through it. And you can suffer because of the choices you make in life. You, and you can suffer because of divine discipline or undeserved suffering. Now the people of the Middle East are going to go under undeserved suffering because God is moving his plan. He's, he's shuffling things around in the Middle East. Um, and so there are six questions that I want to I want to answer that I think would be important in this, that we might see the importance of a spiritual mature believer being able to hold his ground 
uh, in the Word of God with what's going on in his life and in circumstances around his life. And because he trusts in God and trusts in what God is doing around him, this man is going to have a spiritual impact that's going to, because of super grace status, that's going to have historical impact all the way down through the corridors of history into this room right here tonight. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? I mean, you talk about a long history. I mean, it stretched all the way down and popped into Roebuck. I mean, that's pretty powerful. And, and, and here's a guy who lived ions, and we talk about Joseph as if we were at lunch with him today. I mean, that's, that's how popular, and who doesn't, I mean, if you're a little kid growing up in a church, you're going to read about Joseph. You're going to read about Adam and Eve and Abraham, and you're going to read about Cain and Abel, and you're going to read about Joseph. I mean, he, he, he's bigger than life. Then you're, going to meet, you're going to read about Moses and Joshua as they march around, you know, seven times, Jericho and all that. You're going to read these great stories, and, and, and he's part of that great stories. I don't know anybody that doesn't grow up in church. Uh, now, I didn't read them because I didn't grow up in church, but people who grow up in church, these, these are the stories you, you read and, and then are taught. So here are six questions that I, I want to answer before we move on. The first question is, how was it possible that a pagan nation, and Egypt was a pagan nation, they weren't heathenistic at this point because God used them in a marvelous way. How is it possible that a pagan nation like Egypt could become the breadbasket for the Middle East when the severe famine hit them just like the rest of the nations of the Middle East? I mean, they weren't spared the, the famine, but they survived it. And they survived it well enough to be the breadbasket of all the other uh, people of, of the Middle East. For sure the Middle East. For sure. And maybe further than that. The answer is Pharaoh was told ahead of time. This is how, this is how they survive. Pharaoh was told ahead of time through a spiritual dream that only one person, he had this dream about this stuff, and yet there was only one person in the, in the entire Middle East who could interpret it. You talk about strategic importance. Only one person. We read about that earlier in Genesis 41. In, the, in the, the chapter 41, verse 12, and 13, it says, now a young Hebrew, and we know he was a slave, this is Joseph, was there with us, a servant of the captain of a guard, because this is coming from prison. This is a prison letter. And the cupbearer says, we told him our dreams. He, you know, he was the one of the two that survived. Uh, we told him our dreams. He tells Pharaoh's people. And he interpreted them for us. E and giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And the things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I, I was restored to my position. He says, for example, I was restored to my position and the other man was hanged. Just like the dream and just like the interpretation of the dream. Right down. I mean, he, he, what he would say in our lingo is right down to the letter. I mean, this happened right down to the letter. Robert, don't come in and out. Either stay out or stay in, okay, buddy, while I'm teaching. Um, a young Hebrew, this is the hung, a young Hebrew guy, and he says he interpreted our dreams, and it turned out exactly as he interpreted. In Psalms 119, 133, the, the psalm writer says that God establishes my, established my footsteps my footsteps are established in your word and, do, and you do not let any iniquity have dominion over me. I mean, that's the power of the word of God. Now, look, Joseph didn't come out of college, get this great job and move into this high position. Right? No. I mean, he wound up in, 
in a pit sold into slavery, right? He went through the hard knocks. He went through God's school. He went through God's school of interpretation of dreams. He went through God's school. God establishes our footsteps in his word. When Joseph got out of that pit, he had that principle down. It don't matter where I go. It don't matter what I do. What does matter is that God guides my steps. That's true for you and I. That's why it's called walk in the spirit. That's why it's called walk in the, in the, the walk by faith. Listen, yes, that's where you should be walking. But listen, you need God to make that walk. The word of God establishes your steps. Am I, am I doing the right thing? Am I making the right choices? Say that type of thing. In Proverbs 16, 9, it says, the mind, of, the mind of man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. I mean, Joseph knows that better than probably anybody in this room. I mean, he had a plan. His father said, I want you to go carry lunch out. I want you to check on the boys, see how they're doing. They're, they're off. And he never gets to return home. I mean, he goes, he, his footsteps takes him into a, danger, a landmine and a pit. And God is mercy sells him. And he sells him, listen, listen. They could, have, they could have picked him up and sold him anyway. Listen, think about this. They, they were on a caravan trading route. Right? This, that's obvious. Listen, a caravan coming the other way could have picked him up and took him to another nation on the other side. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It had been just as easy. That caravan has just got one highway. It's the king's highway for the, from Egypt. It's just one big super highway and everybody travels it. This is not a caravan leaving Egypt. That, that caravan went down there. They picked up stuff to sell on the way home. Right? But listen, God, God directs all this stuff in a believer's life. And a believer's got to know that. And it's got to be okay with them. And God can shift your, your dreams and your aspirations and your expectations and your life around it and you should be content with it. He can move the furniture in your life around and you should be content with it. Now it's hard sometimes to do that, but you have to understand the principle. It doesn't matter how you make your plans, you want him to direct your steps. And you've got to be okay when he changes your plans. You know, I mean, Joseph had every intentions of getting a report and taking it back to home and, and uh, playing his guitar that night. Maybe serenade some sweet little girl. He was 17. You know, his only interest wasn't in sheep. So, I mean, this is a great principle. It depends on what God is training us for, but all of it is God is trying to direct our steps for us to get our head into proper focus. That Let God have control. Let him have control. Every time we think we're in control, we're not, right? Every time we think we are, we're not. But we always looking back saying, oh, geez, I was, whew. if I'd have just waited and thought this thing out. I'd have been so better off, but yeah, well, look, I learned. I lost, you know, I lost thousand dollars, but boy, did I learn! Right? But God would like to listen. God would like to be ahead of it. Was he ahead? Listen, was he ahead of his program in Joseph's life? Oh wow! Was he ahead of the life of the of Pharaoh? Oh wow! See, I mean, listen, God's ahead of all of our plans, right? I mean, I mean, he's the origin. <laughs> so. Listen, so Pharaoh was told ahead by a spiritual dream that only one man in the Middle East, only one man probably on the earth, according to the scriptures, uh, 
And God had prepared that one man. He had prepared that one man. Okay? Now here's the second question. What was the reason for God sending a starvation famine upon the Middle East? I mean, God sent it. You know, one of the interesting things, if you have an insurance policy, there, there's a, there are all, all, all kinds of clauses that fall under acts of God. Right? Even those who don't believe in God have that policy. I used to remind the atheist I would meet, you got insurance? Of course I got insurance. You ought to pull it out and read it. Because if you do, then it proves you're not an atheist. Or you're not true to what you believe. What was the reason God sensed a starvation famine upon the Middle East? The answer, to bring two nations together peacefully in the plan of God, Israel and Egypt. That's why. Listen, God's way are so higher than our ways and his thoughts so higher than our thoughts. It would be nice if we believed that, wouldn't it? <laughs> It would save us so much heartache. I didn't say headache. I said heartache. It's a lot worse. For Israel, Joseph says to his brothers, he says, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth. My pastor used to call it a pivot because it was more important than a remnant. A lot of things pivoted around it. A lot of things pivot around a remnant of God's people. God sent me for you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by great deliverance. That's going to, listen, he's, he's looking ahead in prophecy and may not even realize it. Because the famine is going to be that bad. But prophetically, he looked way down the corridors in that prophetic word. To Egypt, listen to this. God said to Abram, Abraham, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. They will be in enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. Now, he didn't tell them who it was. He just told them what it was going to be. Now, this is 400-year-old, that, that this thing that's going to about to happen now is in the works. It has been setting on the prophetic shelf, like the second coming of Christ, sets on a prophetic shelf waiting for fulfillment. Joseph is going to be one of the persons, one of the people that's going to activate that whole prophetic idea that has laid there since Abraham on the prophetic shelf. Is that amazing? I mean, look, our lives are all engaged in that. There's not a person in here, if you love the Lord, if you pay attention, if you're into his word and his word is into you, that you're not fulfilling prophetic things that have been on shelves. I mean, when John the Baptist came, he talked about it. it. It was the voice. He was a 400 year old voice of prophecy of Christ. We we live in a fulfillment of prophecy. The church, this great mystery, we are we are unfolding this great mystery, this historical mystery. In our lives, Genesis fifteen thirteen. It talks about, we didn't know what that was, but now we know it's Egypt. We know it's Egypt. Look. Genesis 10 and 11 tell us God is in control of nations. There were no such thing as nations until God gave it a name. He put people into boundaries with languages and nations were the result. Nations are not on their own. They rise and fall at his command. 
When nations survive, you look for them in prophecy somewhere. Think how many nations have come and gone. We don't even know who they were. They were we know where the original 70 were. But here's Egypt. And he's still around. Still around. Still around. Going to be around for a long time too. Because, listen. Learn. You say, well, I know God's in control. Well, look, do you realize, do you think, you think God's in control of nations? Sure I do. Do you think he's in control of uh, the atmospheres? Do you think he's in control of the first, first, second, and third heaven? Sure. And why do you listen to these doomsday pay people talk about stuff? Well, you know, uh, if we keep having babies, uh, you know, population explosion, if, if, you know, if, if we don't figure out how car, how cows can quit doing such and such, they're, they're going to kill us. We got to quit eating meat and get rid of cows because they're putting too much gas in the. I mean, gee whiz. Is there no end? Listen, listen, I understand why these people do that because they have no idea about God. They don't know what, how his sovereignty works over a nation or a people or a planet. Listen, we've done all this exploration out in outer space and we're as dumb as the day we left. As far as the big picture, have we learned things? Oh, yeah, we've learned things. I'll tell you the greatest thing we've learned, that we didn't know what we were talking about to start with. <laughs> Is that not the truth? Yep. I mean, that's one thing. And every time they try to figure out something and put it down and say, well, we finally discovered it, the next time they go up, they go like, well, we were wrong. Uh, we didn't realize that this thing. And then they throw God under a bus. They come back and say, we don't want God in our schools. We don't want God in our public square. We don't want God in the Pledge of Allegiance. We don't want God in the Constitution. We... The church must not think that way. That's the life support system of the earth is the church in this dispensation. Got to tell people the truth. The truth will set them free. The truth will set them free at that thinking positive. Here's the third question. Why did God need to move Joseph from his family, from his community, from his nation, and move him to Egypt? But he did it. Why does he have to do that? I mean, I hear people like, I don't understand why, why I had it. Uh. You know, his dad didn't understand what happened to Joseph. He thought he died. He thought he got killed by ant wild animals. The boys brought back the 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 coat of many colors and the only color it had was red. I don't know what the other colors were, but I know what the one was that they soaked it in blood. Here's the answer why. Joseph gave you the answer. Joseph gave us the answer in the fifth chapter, verse 20, when he said, as for you, my brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to. See, I, I believe Romans 8, 28. I think he believed it in, in, in doctrinal principle, that God works all, all, all things towards good, right? To good. But listen, how do you walk that out in your life? There's a principle. All right? That, that's absolute. That God is going to work everything in your life. Everything that goes, there's no such thing as good and bad. It's all good. You know, people say, oh, a bad thing happened to me the other day. That's good. I mean, no, that's bad. No, that's good. It sounds like that thing, who's on first, who's on, what's on second or whatever that other. Right? When you talk to somebody, you think, it, I, it so, I sound like this, like a comedy act. But, the, but listen, 
Romans 8, 28 becomes important to you when you walk it out. Listen to how he walked Romans 8, 28. You, you, the backside of Romans 8, 28 is a view upon your life in which God did what he promised you. How, it, how did, here, here's what I ask people. And they say, well, do you believe in Romans 8, 28? Do you believe that God works everything? I say, yeah, give me an example. Okay, give me one. Because if it's not working out, you're not applying it. See, there's got to be an order to. Listen to this now. I'm going to read it again because you're missing it. God meant it for good in order, in order to bring about this present results to preserve many people. In other words, you've got to be able, I tell people you should journalize, you should write a journal of how God is living through your life. And you ought to see it. Because when you get in that place where it looks like it's bad, and God says it's good, you've got to walk it out so that you look back and say, whoa, that was good. You understand? Because you're never going to see it. If you're into something God calls good and you keep calling it bad, it's not going to be walked out. When you call it good, you walk it out, you need to document how it was good. You understand what I'm saying to you? That's a life experience. Joseph, in chapter 50, is talking about life experience out of the pit, through Potiphar, through the prison, through a famine. He has had to apply God works everything for good so many times in his life, and he looked back and he went, there it is. I was in a pit, now I'm not. I was in Potiphar's house, I'm not. I was in prison, I'm not. God faithful to his word. See? You've, you've got to, if he quote these Bible verses is only half of the journey. Learning these Bible verses is only half of the journey. Living them out. Learn them to live. Living them out is where you begin to see the awesomeness and the sovereignty of God over your life. You need to have those. You need to have those pictures in your soul so that the next time when God wretches it up a little bit in your life, that you can go, listen, I know he's faithful and I know this is good. I don't care how, how, how bad it looks to other people and even to myself when I look at it, I know it is good. Because God is good and in him there is no evil. See that? So this is really important. I really want you to get this idea with Joseph reflecting back on it. God is good. God, what, God, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. It wasn't that he didn't see it that way. He just flipped it. He just saw something that had been done to him that was evil, that was bad, that was rotten to the core. He flipped it in his life. He didn't let that affect him. Did they do that to him? Yes. Did he flip it? Yes, he did. He went, thank you, God, that you're good. The, there are people that are bad, mean, and ugly in this world, and they will mistreat me, but you won't. And I know you will flip it in my life if I let you. So I'm going to stick with you, God, because I know you're good. Yeah, look what he named his son. Yes. He summarized his entire life. Yes, he did. By, by the names he gave his son. He summarized them at the age 28. Yep. He, he sure did. Ephraim and Manasseh. He sure did. He sure did. He, he, he named his kid after his journey in Egypt. Uh, he, uh, listen to uh, Genesis 37, 4. His brothers saw, now this was when Joseph was at home. This is why God had to remove him from this family, from that community, from that nation, from that nation of people to Egypt, which was a, a pagan nation. How bad is that? That God, it's better for Joseph to be in a pagan nation than, in the, than to be in a a. a a believing family's home, community, and people. But listen, the bigger picture is God, God's got a man that he that is positive towards him, that's a hungry young man for God and God's word, and God is going to take that young man and make him into what 
listen, at 17, God begins to parent. Listen to me. At some point in your life, God has become, God has become your parent. I, I, one of the great difficulties that I found early in my life with my young people, my, my children, was to convert them from my parenting to his. I found that enormously difficult in my life. Switching them off from me. Have you, have, what's the Bible say? How, have you approached God? Do you not know that God is your father? He is the father that will never leave you nor forsake you. I cannot promise you that in my life. My life is temporal. It's not eternal. My soul is, but not my life. It's temporal. I mean, I, I'm here today and gone tomorrow. What do I know? This is true in every one of my life. For me, when I discovered as a believer that God wanted to parent me, my life, my life took off. I read the scriptures as God speaking to me, parenting me. And I continue that. Listen, I don't just pray, my heavenly father who art in heaven. That's my dad. He's not some supreme being. I think of God as my dear heavenly father. And that's how I approach him. His brothers, listen, while he was at home, this is why God's got to move him. His brothers saw that his father loved him more than all of his brothers. Now, how would they know that? They don't know his heart. If they'd ask him, Father, do you love Joseph more than you love me? You know, he would typically tell them whatever parent says, no, I love you just as much as I love the others. If you've got many kids, they're going to ask you that because it seems to you favor one over another often. And if not, they perceive it. It's a perception. It is a perception based on how, how things are, are treated and said in the home and done. Joseph was bold about it. I mean, uh, Jacob was bold about it, though. He told everybody. Apparently, this was a common idea at the supper table. I love Rachel. Rachel is the love of my life. Therefore, her children are. You understand that? And everybody in family knew that because he talked about it. He talked about it. Joseph knew it, and so did Benjamin. And the rest of them knew these two kids were separate from the rest of them. That's how that thing happened. And he didn't help matters along. And his dad certainly did, because his dad, his dad truly favored him. No matter what he tells him, well, I love you, and, you know, I provide for you and take care of you. But, you know, his words and the way he treated spoke volumes to these kids to the rest of the family. So his brother saw that his father saw that his father loved him more than all of his brothers, so they hated him. They didn't hate the father. <laughs> they hated him. And they could not speak to him on friendly terms. That's not a, a listen, that whole family was messed up. And let me tell you, if your family's messed up, listen to me, if your family's messed up, own up to it because it starts at the top. Come on now. I hate that too. I hate that too. I hate that idea. Here's the fourth question. Why was Joseph chosen by God from among Jacob's family to be the preserver of two nations in the plan of God? How come, how come Jacob wasn't picked? He was the patriarch. How come he wasn't picked? That's the most likely guy, right? He's a head knocker, man. And how about, how come Judah wasn't? He, he's, he's the heir in line to the Messiah. How come he wasn't picked? You know why? Because they weren't spiritual. 
God had to reach all the way through that whole family down, down to the second from the bottom being Joseph and then Benjamin in that family. Answer, Joseph said, God sent me before you to preserve life. Why was Joseph chosen by God? Well, because you're the one, you're the one guy that, that will listen to me to get the job done. Nobody in your family listens to me, not even your father. Your father was a time when your father would listen to me. Your father don't listen to me anymore. I've pretty much put him on the shelf. Joseph, Joseph was teachable. He had some things that had to be burned out of him because of, of, of the way he was raised and trained and all that kind of stuff. But he was teachable. In Genesis 45, 8, Now therefore, it was not you who sent me here, Joseph says, but God. And he has made me. Do you know that? He has made me who I am. Now he was, he was pretty top up on there, wasn't he? God, and listen to how he describes what God has made me. He's made me a father to Pharaoh. Can you imagine that? A father to Pharaoh, the lord of his household and ruler over the whole land of Egypt. Who did that? God. You know, it's one thing to have some kind of status in life and you've worked hard to get it. You've done this. But listen, you know how you really got it? God. And at some point in your life, you ought to acknowledge it. I mean, he learned to acknowledge where his success came from in his life. And it was true. Listen, what I love about this is this is who jo Joseph was. This is who Joseph believes in Christ in the world. Say, who, who do you believe you are in Christ in the world? So this is who he believed he was. I believe I'm father to Pharaoh. I think I'm lord of his household. I think I'm ruler over all the land of Egypt. That's who I think I am. That's who I think I am. That's who I think I am in Christ in the world. Here's the fifth question. What spiritual training method did God use with Joseph as a spiritual advancing believer? Now, he's teachable, but he, boy, he's rough around the edges. He's teachable, but he's rough, rough around the edges. So what method did God use? Did he set him down in a classroom and teach him? Now, I'll tell you what he used. <laughs> Which, well, that's what we call it in the world, isn't it? Yeah. We call it undeserved suffering in the church. God used, but here's what's interesting to me. What is interesting to me, because he's 17, God used different types of authority in training, training Joseph from the pit to Potiphar's home to prison, to Pharaoh. When I saw that, I thought, boy, is that not the way he does it? I know he, he took me off from a farm authority, put me under athletic authority, put me under educational authority, and stuck me in the military. He put me in the military of which I was never supposed to go. I was a sole surviving son of a second war um, death veteran. He died on the field, battlefield. I was a sole surviving heir to the name of Adama at the time and was never, I was told all of my life from a little bitty baby, I was never going to military. Don't worry. Don't go down. You don't need to. You know, we had to register, but don't worry about it. It's never going to happen. The same year I got saved, listen to me. Let's show you something. The same year I got saved, the very same year I got saved, I was called to Montgomery. I was told, don't worry about it. It's just a preliminary. Listen. 
that evening, I had raised my hand and I was on a train. I don't know where it was going. That train stopped. I got off. I called Jane because nobody knew where I was. And I told her, I'm on a train. I'm in the, I've, I've been inducted into the army. And I have no idea where this train is going. I'll try to tell you when I get there. They wouldn't even tell me where the train was going. I was having an absolutely civilian fit. And didn't realize I was a soldier already. And I'm going to tell you, I spent two years in that military. And I would have thought that I, I had come under great training. I had great authority training in my life. And what I lacked, the military gave me. Respect for a position of authority and not the person. It's not about the person. It's about the position he holds. It's about his rank. That was, a, that was a missing link in my whole training about authority. It was a missing link. And boy, did, they, did I get that thing squared away. I dug so many latrine holes before I went. I surrendered my shovel for a weapon. That was a, it was great training. And, and my point is this. When I see this in Joseph's life, I think, well, look, he was in a pit. And look, he went to Potiphar, then he went to prison. And every time it says, and those that were in authority over him saw that he was very submissive and a great learner and took charge and all of that stuff. See, he's learning. God is teaching him how to be great leaders for God, how to be a great leader for God. And, and, it, and he's, under, he's in, in undeserved suffering. And God is, God is, listen, God is shifting authority people over his life. To, to train him and to get him leveled out. And I'll bet you, if you stopped and thought about your life, if you're not rebellious against authority at your age today, and you look back, there are people and key experiences in your life that brought you along the way. I look, what I did, when I look back, I went, whoa, I could see that. I could see that in my life. I mean, I didn't have just any old football coach. I mean, I had... The meanest, winningest coach you could possibly imagine, and I didn't select him. You know, I went to the school, and he was there, and I wanted to play football. I had no idea who this man was. I had no idea. I had never played football in my life except my freshman year. I didn't know that, I didn't know that he was the most winningest coach and all that stuff. I didn't know that. didn't care until I got there. <laughs> I certainly learned it afterwards. Authority, authority training is a key. So God uses different types of authority from the pit to Potiphar's home to prison and into the prime minister. And the answer for my question, what spiritual training method did God use? It was undeserved suffering. All of this is undeserved suffering until God has them ready to put them in a key position. And if you look back to your life, you, you look at the different ways you were trained to get where you are today. It's amazing. It's an amazing journey. It's an amazing journey. Listen to Philippians 129 and 30. For to you, that's individual, for to you it has been granted. That's a word that you get grace from. There are different words for grant in the Bible. Karizomai is this word. It, it's the word for grace. It's a verb for grace. It's an aorist passive in, in, indicative, third person singular, for those who are interested. It was for you. It was for you. It has been granted for Christ's sake. Now, look, it's got you. Look, you're going to miss it. For to you, it, what is the it? The it is going to be described as suffering, believing and suffering. The it, for to you, it has been granted for whose sake? For Christ's sake. It's always the bigger picture. Your life is always engaged as a believer in the bigger picture. Not only it has been granted not only to believe in him, but also to suffer. Here we are again, for his sake. 
experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. In other words, this is common to the believer of the church age. In 1 Peter 4, 19, watch what he's after when he puts you through suffering, undeserved suffering. Therefore, those who also suffer according to the will of God, that's undeserved. Listen to me. Shall entrust their souls. This is what they learn. They learn how to trust their souls to a faithful creator God. Somebody who is in charge. You know why they go to the creator? Because it's the origin of everything. He's called the creator. He's my heavenly father. He's all these. He goes back to say this. Entrust your soul to the one who created it. The sovereign God. That's a powerful idea in 1 Peter 4.19. Those who are suffering according to the will of God. Why? So they can learn to entrust their soul. Oh boy, did not Joseph learn that? Oh yeah. Listen, you must learn that too. See, that's one of the good things that come out of this whole thing. You know, where God does all things for good. Because Joseph, watch this now. Because Joseph didn't resist or fight his authority training under undeserved suffering, his, watch this now, his spiritual growth as well as undeserved suffering went faster. Do you realize he's 17? 13 years later, he's prime minister of Egypt. That's fast track. I mean, he's father to he's Pharaoh's father. He's lord of his household. He's in charge of all the land of Egypt. Let me tell you a prayer. <laughs> Hebrews, Hebrews, the fourth chapter, fourteen through sixteen. Listen, let us approach the throne of grace. With confidence. See that? With confidence. I mean, you know what confidence? Knowing how to pray and hit the target and get the answer. Hmm? Yeah, you got to be bold, but you got to know what you're talking about. Right? Got to be bold. I mean, not loud. So that we may receive mercy. I'm going to approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I mean, what a powerful verse that is. I mean, do you know people in, in need? Yeah, all the time. I mean, every day, every week goes by. I mean, God shows us. Listen, be able to go to the throne of grace. He's talking about prayer with confidence so you can receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I used to go down to the Salvation Army and teach every... I don't know, Monday night or something. I would tell these guys that. <laughs> they never heard it. Every once in a while, some guy would go like, whoa, would you explain that to me? Come up to me afterwards and say, could you explain that to me? I'm like, you betcha. <sighs> Let's approach the throne of grace with confidence and we will receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. These guys were all there because of need. They never, they never, they never dealt with the need they needed. <laughs> Max, I want you to go to I want you to go to Second Corinthians. I want you to show you the attitude you should have. We call it RMA, a relaxed mental attitude. I'll show you this. Listen, we're going to approach the throne of what? Grace. Right? Find mercy and find grace. Right? Receive mercy and find grace for time and need. Now here, look. I want you to put your eyes on it. Second Corinthians, twelfth chapter. Paul. This is Paul talking. 9 10. Listen to what he says. He said, this is what God has told me about my prayer life. I pray for things. I pray for it. I don't, and I, I've, I've prayed according to his will. I don't get the answer. What's that mean you don't get the answer? Well, I was praying to get a specific thing. I didn't get it. I asked it according to the will of God. I didn't get it. So I prayed again. I didn't get it. So I prayed again. I prayed three times according to the will of God. I know according to John 5, 14 and 15 that if I pray according to his will, he hears me. And I know if he hears me, I, I get the request. 
He said, on the third time I prayed for this, I got the answer. And he tells you the answer he got. Here's the answer that God gave him. He said, the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Because he had this thorn in the flesh that just disabled him in what his normal life function would be. You understand that? 12.9. My grace, and here's what he taught me. Because I had this thorn in the flesh, it was disabling me to do what I normally could do in my life. And I was really struggling with it. And I kept praying for help. Health, not help. I kept praying for health in the time of need. And I didn't get it. So I prayed again. I didn't pray again. I didn't. Then he finally answered my prayer. He, he answered my prayer with the word of God. He gave me a word that has changed my life, he said. The word that I got didn't change my condition. It changed my attitude. And with a change of attitude, it changed my life. Because I discovered that God had a different picture, a different responsibility to minister with me, and they'd explain why. My, he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient. See, we go to the throne of grace. We find mercy. We're, gonna, we're, we're, we're looking for grace in time of need. He gives it to us, and we don't see it because we're expecting something else. So he comes back and he says, don't question my grace. Qu you're questioning my grace. My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. Then he says, for the lesson I want you to learn so that you that power, my power, God's power is perfected or matured or reached its goal in your weakness. God's power, His grace is sufficient, and His power is sufficient over your weakness. See what I mean? Then listen to what He says. Here's, and He says, now here's my testimony. He said, so I want to give you my testimony, because this was the answer to my prayer. He said, most gladly, therefore, and this is his personal testimony of his life. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I've become content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecution, with difficulties. For Christ's sake, because undeserved suffering is all about Christ. For Christ's sake, for when, am I, when I am weak, I am strong. When I am at my weakest, through the power of God, I'm at my strongest. I've had to learn to change the way I think. I didn't realize that I was running so much of God's ministry on my own strength. He took my strength away, put weakness in his place. Undeserved suffering. And taught me how to actually minister without human ability and strength to get jo God's job done 100% because he would give me the power. That is what God wants us to learn when he says that not only did I call you to be saved, but to suffer for my sake. Because there are things that I'm going to teach you that you can teach other people they are going to really need it. I'm going to teach you how to be strong in weakness. Weakness is not a liability unless you try to wrestle it out, try to manage it on your own. Surrender it to the power of God and let strength replace it. And now you're going to see from this, the 12th chapter of 2 Corinthians, this has clicked in Paul. When you start reading Ephesians, and Colossians, and these books, 
you're going to see an enormous difference in the way he's teaching on this subject. It is a powerful lesson. When you read the book of Ephesians and Colossians and you understand they go together as volume one and two and read that in context of what he has learned through this, it's a powerful idea. It's a powerful idea. When I am weak, then I am strong. Listen, he didn't try to be weak. God showed him he already was. And he, he took away his strength through undeserved suffering. He put him in a physical condition to show him and to teach him this lesson and never removed it. He lived with it. But listen, he lived above it. Because he learned how to be strong in weakness. Well, I think I've gone about as far as I can go tonight. You can, you can do the rest of it, can't you? We only have one more for you to look at. That was number six. Why wasn't Jacob or Judah chosen? Okay. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll, we'll get the internet people back to their homes and then we'll have our prayer time if you have a prayer request this will be the time in a moment father we're so, so thankful for these who have come our way tonight by automobile and by internet wherever they are both in america and around the world we're thankful to have them visit with us we pray father tonight they have learned things that the father has placed upon our heart to know and we've tried to explain to our people we pray father that this lesson would not go without great impact upon people's life. We know that the word never returns void once it's set out under the power of the Holy Spirit. So we pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life.